We now move to questions to the Minister for Communities, and I call Claire Bailey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, question one. As outlined in AQW 34321621, my officials are taking forward activity to increase the participation of women in community development in order to address paramilitarism, as outlined in Section A, Paragraph 3.9 of the Fresh Start Agreement through two related strands of activity. Strand 1 relates to a detailed co-design process and through this my officials are presently engaged with key stakeholders from the statutory and voluntary and community sector, including the following. Uh, my department, Department of Justice, the Executive Office, Cooperation Ireland, Training for Women Network, Probation Board for Northern Ireland, Women's Resource Development Agency, Community Foundation for Northern Ireland, Women's Support Network, Northern Ireland Rural Women's Network, Rural Community Network, FOIL Women's Information Network and Intercom. Um, this work between my officials and key stakeholders has been ongoing since June of this year and it is planned that the output from this co-design work will form the basis of a Northern Ireland-wide consultation process with implementation of an agreed programme early in 2017-18. Claire Bailey for a supplementary. Thank you. Um, given that the women that women have been allocated so little targeted resource under the Fresh Start Agreement and that this new co-design process of working is meant as a, to target grassroots organisations working in their field. Is the Minister content that all those organisations just listed are expert in women's participation or indeed even have a strong record in the area? Well, the rationale for how these organisations were identified uh, was through their experience the networks, the sectoral intelligence to identify the key stakeholders who we believe to be well positioned within the community development sector in areas of women's participation and conflict transformation. Uh, I know the proposed time frame is challenging for taking forward this process and that was a major determinant in the selection of key stakeholders. Officials identified organisations with the key experience and capacity that could contribute to the co-design process whilst ensuring that any other organisation who expressed an interest uh, could join the process. Membership of the co-design group represents those groups who were willing to become involved in the co-design process and who agreed to the conditions outlined in the terms of reference. Participation on this co-design group is dependent on all stakeholders involved agreeing to be actively involved in a positive contribution to the process and not merely being part of an oversight group. Here I'm Sir Claire Hanna. I call Claire Hanna. Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister uh, for his answers. Can the Minister confirm that uh, when the uh, real stage and not just the preparatory stage of Fresh Start uh, funding is advanced, that that will give expression to the strand of Fresh Start that is about empowering win women and not just uh, rolling it up with the wider aim of tackling paramilitarism? And does he agree with me that part of tackling, par tackling paramilitarism will be about empowering women to stand up to paramilitaries in their communities and that therefore emboldening groups related to paramilitaries will be counterproductive in this respect? Well, very much. This is about uh, emboldening women within uh, communities to be able to take the community forward. I know uh, from my own engagement um, right across the community, women very much are to the fore at challenging uh, government and those within their own community about the things that hold uh, the next generation back. And so I very much want to see women being empowered. That's why within the Fresh Start we've identified that there's a key role to, to be played. And this work uh, that is being taken forward is to do exactly that. I call Christopher Stolford. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, the Minister has outlined uh, some of how the organisations uh, were identified to be involved in the co-design process. Can the Minister detail for the House what monitoring processes will be put in place while they carry out their work and how the department will ensure accountability? Well, there's an ongoing piece of work from my department that's carrying out the oversight to ensure that uh, what is being designed is going to deliver uh, what we want it uh, to deliver. Um, the expectation in terms of when the co-design process is to be completed uh, in the autumn, and that will be followed with a public consultation process. Uh, the tendering process for potential delivery partners is planned for early uh, 2017, and the formal launch of the programme is planned again for early 2017-18. Here, Sir Karen Lee Cullen. I called Karen Lee Cullen. From Elgut, Las Cancola, and Minister, thank you for your answers thus far. 
It's really just to expand on the question that Claire Bailey raised. That, not to be disparaged about some of the groups the Minister has mentioned that the officials have been in contact with, but more often than not, officials go to the big groups in the voluntary sector and forget about the smaller groups who do, do a lot of the work on the ground in the community sector. Can you give this assurance, as this programme rolls out, that those groups, women's groups particularly in the community, will not become invisible? Well, at this stage, uh, the identification of the uh, groups that I uh, outlined, there was a sound rationale for that, and obviously it was to ensure that uh, the need uh, was manageable for the size of the group that was re responsible for taking this forward. But I'm happy to give the assurance, uh, as this is developed, uh, we want to hear from all groups that uh, are going to be charged with carrying out this important work. I call Roy Beggs. Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, I welcome the, the proposal to empower women and uh, enable them to carry out a role in addressing paramilitarism. But one of the problems with paramilitarism is the fact that individuals, sometimes very strong individuals, can dominate their community, but also many involved are involved in domestic violence. So how is the minister going to ensure that he is not sending out a signal that dominant characters uh, are going to be further empowered and further emboldened and potentially uh, dominate female members of their community? Well, uh, let me use the opportunity on the floor of this House to make it absolutely clear uh, there should be no role for anyone uh, in a community that engages in domestic violence. A government that would support any such individuals uh, would be rightly ridiculed for that, uh, and in no way should this executive ever be empowering individuals to dominate a community. Uh, what this is about is empowering women uh, to tackle some of these issues that are prevalent in our society. I call Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Community Minister for his response to Mr Stitt's description of North Down Defender Flute Band as homeland security that will defend North Down from anybody? Well, I think my colleague made it clear this morning in respect of those comments. Um, we have a, a police service of Northern Ireland that's responsible for upholding law and order. Uh, any individuals who don't support the rule of law, uh, in my view, shouldn't be uh, worthy of getting the support from this government. I call Jim Allister. Uh, in light of what the minister says, how does it help then address paramilitarism by funding those closely associated with illegal organizations, either as chief executives or otherwise? Doesn't that just confirm them in their self-inflated idea that they are Mr. Biggs in their community, communities that they still are determined to dominate. Isn't it folly to pick out such people and organizations for funding? Well, organizations who I work with, uh, some indeed have had a past. And what I recognize very clearly is there are people who have wholeheartedly moved way beyond the place they ever were in. And what I will do is work al alongside those individuals and organisations who are very much committed to taking their community forward. I believe that there are those individuals uh, who do that. Uh, I know uh, right across this chamber there are individuals and political parties, indeed political parties, who very much support uh, organisations who have had associations with the past conflict. Uh, I don't believe that uh, those individuals should be sidelined. Uh, I believe that we need to ensure that individuals who genuinely want to move on, that support the police, are supported in doing so. I call Gary Middleton for a question. Question number two, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, motorcycle uh, road racing is an extremely popular sport across the province. It generates a lot of passion, both amongst riders and followers, and fosters a strong cultural identity within Northern Ireland and beyond. While responsibility for improving safety at motorcycle road races rests with the organisers and promoters of a road race event, it is important that my department provide support to the road racing fraternity in order that road racing is made as safe as it can be. Officials from my department and Sport NI have engaged with two and four wheels and a number of motorcycle racing clubs to identify priorities at a number of motorsports venues, including road racing circuits. As a result, I am delighted that my department has been able to provide financial assistance, which will help to improve safety at a number of venues, including the Northwest 200, the Ulster Grand Prix and the Armoy races. 
Uh, to take this commitment forward, my officials are working directly with a number of clubs involved in delivering road racing events to provide safety equipment and to deliver improvements to the infrastructure of the circuits. As a first step, I have been able to announce funding of £124,000 specifically for the North West 200. Uh, this investment will improve the safety for the riders on the circuit with the provision of curb protectors, safety bales and a new race warning system. In addition, the funding provided will help enhance the existing spectator safety equipment uh, used at the event. Uh, I know that this investment will support the organisers as they continue to make safety improvements for both the competitors and spectators at one of Northern Ireland's top international events. The organisers recognise that safety at event is an important part of their event management plans. I take very seriously the importance of safety at sports events and will continue to ensure that my department provides support wherever it can. Barry Middleton for a supplementary. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And can I uh, welcome the, the funding announced by the Minister? Uh, can the Minister outline whether this equipment will be shared across other uh, motorsport events? Well, this was part of the conversation that I had when I met with uh, Mervyn White and the uh, Member of Parliament for North Antrim in respect of the equipment. Um, it was something that I felt was important to emphasise the need to share uh, equipment. So the majority of the equipment being purchased will be available to other event organisers, such as the safety bales and safety uh, barriers. So th this isn't just an investment that will benefit the North West 200. Uh, other road racing events will also benefit. Uh, motorsport event organisers and promoters already share safety equipment where possible, and any investment from the department will seek to ensure that this continues. Uh, the motorcycle racing clubs have long-standing arrangements with other clubs and indeed other event organisers outside of motorcycle racing uh, to share the safety equipment. Call Robin Swan. Speaker, and I thank the Minister's commitment to providing additional safety equipment. Can I ask him what conversations he's had with the Minister of Infrastructure to make sure that the road surfaces are suitable and safe for racing on? And I know he's mentioned the North West and Armoy. Could he also have a look then maybe at the Mid Antrim, 150 and Clough? Well, obviously, there, there's areas that I can uh, provide assistance to, and I've stepped forward to do that in respect of safety. Obviously, issues around uh, the road surface is a matter for the Department of Infrastructure. I know that uh, his constituency colleague, uh, Mr Storey, uh, had a meeting with me and Billy Kennedy to do with the Armoy races, and I know uh, they are talking to the Divisional Roads Manager in respect of that. Uh, I did have a conversation with the Minister um, for Infrastructure around the, the condition of uh, road surfaces in respect of, of Armoy, but that is something that I know the organisers are, are dealing with at a local uh, divisional area. I did get the opportunity to um, uh, visit Armoy, the racetrack. Uh, Ian Paisley brought me around the track along with uh, Billy Kennedy. Uh, and they were able to identify some of the areas where I believe that this department could provide some support, and I would hope to be able to make an announcement about that in the not too distant future. Aram, sir, Philip Wigan for your cash. I call Philip Wigan for a uh, Last can call you, and I, I welcome the commitment of the minister to uh, ensure safety at sporting events. And just following on from the previous question, can the minister confirm? that the organisers are working with other colleagues and the executive uh, and statutory partners to minimise the risks associated with motorbike racing? Yeah, th this is something that I think is hugely important. Uh, we have a rich heritage when it comes to motorcycle, motorcycle racing in Northern Ireland. Uh, we have produced some of the world's greatest uh, motorcycle racers. Uh, it's a sport that I believe is here to stay. Uh, obviously, whenever there are incidents at races, then it brings into sharp focus uh, the debate that exists around the dangers associated with the sport. And therefore, recognising that it's a sport that uh, I support, it's a sport that I want to see continued, then it's vital that we provide uh, support to these clubs to enhance the safety measures at it. Uh, I don't believe that that will uh, remove the risk entirely from this sport, uh, but we are seeking to do our best to ameliorate against uh, the dangers that exist. I call Lord Morrow for a question. Deputy Speaker, question number three. Well, my department has provided funding nearing £4.6 million for the delivery of the two phases of the Dungannon Public Realm Scheme. This funding was provided to the Mid Ulster District Council uh, for the design consultation and implementation of both phases of the Public Realm Scheme. The Council was responsible for the appointment of the design teams uh, and the contractors delivering the scheme. Uh, phase 1 of the Public Realm Scheme completed in February 2015 and Phase 2 of the Public Realm completed in September 2016. 
Uh, before proceeding with the delivery of phase one of this project, there was an extensive consultation process with all the key stakeholders in the town. Uh, the design of the scheme took account of all the feedback, including that of Transport NI, formerly the road service, which is responsible for the re-adoption and maintenance of the scheme. This scheme involved the transformation of the town centre, including a new event space. And whilst the majority of this work has been received positively, there has been some negativity with a few aspects of phase one of the scheme. The main concerns relating to the car parking, traffic signalling and the flow of traffic and pedestrian accessibility in the Market Square area of the town. Mid Ulster District Council has identified a number of potential solutions aimed at further enhancing car parking, traffic management and pedestrian movement in the Market Square and is currently engaged on public and statutory consultation on these. As my department provided 100% of the funding for phases one and two of this scheme, the Council will be required to fund any potential enhancements to the current scheme. Lord Morrow for a supplementary. Uh, I thank the, the Minister for that very comprehensive reply, and he might have answered my supplementary in it, but anyway, we'll have a go anyway. Um, the uh, scheme that has been done in the Market Square has many attributes. However, there are one or two deficiencies, not least uh, traffic flow problems and also pedestrian safety. Minister, as you have intimated, the Council proposed now to do further enhancement of the scheme. What discussions have you had with them in relation to their new proposals and to what extent, if any, are you, is your department funding this? In respect of the, the public realm, and I, I set out um, how this was developed and it was led by the Council, uh, but it was 100 per cent funded by my department. I know some members might be asking, well, why, given that uh, Every other council would be asked to make some contribution to public realm. Why was this council allocated 100%? Um, but there was a, a, a context to that. Um, the public realm scheme was designed to complement the council's development of the adjacent Ranfurly Arts and Visitor Centre, and that was officially opened in October 2012. Uh, the 5.5 million uh, re-landscaped People's Park uh, and the Arts and Visitor Centre was created by Dungannon and South Tyrone uh, Council with significant funding from the Heritage Lottery and the Arts Council of Northern Ireland. So, Given that funding at the time by the Council for those elements, my department didn't, uh, did not provide any funding support to this key uh, re regeneration site in Dungannon that the Council had provided. It was agreed, however, that my department would fund the public realm works completely in order to support the regeneration of Dungannon Town Centre. And given that uh, the scheme was designed, led by the Council. Uh, if there are areas now where the Council has identified that it could be improved, that will now be a matter for the Council to provide uh, funding for it. I call Rosemary Barton. Thank you very much, Speaker. Minister, while I hear what you're saying in relation to the problems that there are with the public realm scheme, surely as it was provided 100 per cent funding from you, and these problems have arisen because of perhaps uh, issues that were not foreseen, surely we would, could you not provide some funding towards remedying them? Well, again, given that the Council led this, it was the Council that designed it and my department provided 100 per cent funding. Uh, so if there's areas of concern in respect of this, it falls very much at the, the table of the Council to deal with, and rightly other Councils would turn around and ask my department um, why are you not giving 100 per cent funding to all the other public realm schemes that take place in Northern Ireland? So, in order for a fair and ed equitable uh, solution on this, I think the Council uh, are the ones who need to bear responsibility if they feel that there were inadequacies in the design that they actually implemented. Here, Sir Michelle Gildenew. I call Michelle Gildenew. The Minister has pointed out that he is aware that there are difficulties in the square in Dungannon, especially around the plethora of traffic lights and and um, traffic movement within the square. There's also been a couple of years of roadworks, and as a result, people have chosen to shop elsewhere. Is the minister prepared to do anything to help counteract that problem? Well, again, in respect of the funding, uh, this department gave 100% funding to actually help regenerate Dungannon uh, and the town centre. Uh, and therefore, if the council now have identified more ways in which they can improve it, the council are at liberty to raise the finances through their own systems in order to finance that. Uh, Ross Hussey isn't in his place, so I call Jenny Palmer for a question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question five. The Department's single investigation service addresses both customer fraud and customer error and employs 193 staff. 
Uh, within that complement, 75 frontline investigators deal specifically with suspected benefit fraud cases. In 2015 16, 931 sanctions were imposed for benefit fraud, with 272 convictions through the courts and a further 659 administrative penalties imposed by the Department. Uh, Jenny Palmer for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, we were told a year ago that under the Fresh Start Agreement between the Government, uh, your party minister and the Sinn Féin, that there would be £125 million for social security agencies to tackle fraud and error. Uh, I, I'm concerned that the minister said in the last question time, we first need to seek to secure the funding from the Treasurer. I just wonder what took so long? Well, it's not a case of what has taken so long, obviously. Uh, there's continuing conversations taking place with Treasury in order to get the funding that uh, I believe would help us to, to make more uh, effective use of tackling fraud and error, and, and those conversations are continuing. I call William Humphrey. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, and I thank him for his answers so far, what action is his department taking to prepare an Invest to Save scheme uh, for fraud and error as set out in the Stormont House uh, some fresh start agreement? Obviously, the discussions with the Treasury have been taking place, um, and that is obviously deals with the Invest to Save proposal. And that's in order for uh, the Department to access £25 million that was outlined in the Fresh Start Agreement uh, to help address the social security fraud. Uh, I've asked for those discussions to be expedited. Significant work has now been completed in preparing the operational basis upon which savings will be delivered. Fraud investigation, customer compliance visiting and case review processes are all in place and working effectively. Uh, underpinning those operational structures is a new case selection and uh, routing function, meaning that cases can be dealt with more quickly and efficiently. Here, Sir Catherine Seeley. I call Catherine Seeley. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for his answer so far. so far. Can I ask the Minister to confirm that, as well as staff working on fraud, that there are resources and an overview given to looking at error also? Yeah, I'm happy to give that uh, reassurance uh, to the member. Um, in terms of the team that deals with fraud, it also deals with error, and that has identified that uh, error has taken place in terms of claimants that are making it. Uh, that can be unknowingly and, and very much innocently. Um, and also identifying where uh, there has been error in terms of departmental staff as well, um, because around over 99% of the department staff um, obviously calculate this accurately, but there is on occasion some error on the, the part of uh, staff that take place, and that's an ongoing piece of work to make sure we seek to minimise that. Iram, sir, Jerry Mullen. Speaker. Can I ask the Minister uh, what his department is doing to address the very serious problem of housing benefit fraud uh, or dole, proper, dole drops, as they are more commonly known? Apologies. Um, again, the department has very robust measures in place to identify where fraud has taken place, uh, and obviously that is a, an ongoing piece of work, and I'll provide the member with more details in respect of housing benefit fraud. I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you. My question has been answered. I call Stephen Agnew. Then. Thank you. Um, could I ask the Minister how we arrived at the situation whereby we conduct and pay for the investigation of benefit fraud, but uh, all the money recouped goes back to HMRC? And has he any plans to renegotiate that situation? Well, obviously, it's important that wherever the uh, the monies are being channeled through and from Treasury that uh, if it's fraudulent then we seek to identify that and, and whoever is the end recipient of that saving uh, is not the point. Uh, it's just in respect of having confidence in the benefit system that the public uh, believe is right to support, uh, that people who are in receipt of it are receiving it legitimately. Um, in terms of the invest to save, that's a proposal that we have with the Treasury in terms of uh, financing further work that we can do so that the Treasury will allow us to do that and obviously the Treasury will benefit in respect of that. I call Paul Gervin for a question. Uh, thank you. Uh, question number six. 
I am aware of the level of disability in Northern Ireland and the challenges faced by people living with disability. One in five of the local population has a disability. Around 5 per cent of children, 17 per cent of the working age population and 60 per cent of those people aged over 65. Uh, the Department is addressing these challenges through a range of activities. Some examples being driven by my Department are the development of a new wheelchair accommodation standard uh, for new social housing in Northern Ireland, reduction in the backlog of those waiting for suitable accommodation, implementation of the Executive's employment strategy for people with disabilities, implementation of the Active Living No Limits Action Plan, which is supported by £300,000 for a disability sport capital programme, improved library and museum access, the provision of additional sign language classes, access to a range of art forms ensuring both participation and artistic uh, excellence for people with disabilities, and development of a new culture arts strategy. Uh, in addition, improving the quality of life for people with disabilities and their families is a strategic indicator in the new programme for government for which my department has policy responsibility. The draft delivery plan for Indicator 42 has been developed through engagement with people with disabilities and their representative organisations. Uh, the draft programme for government, um, including uh, the Indicator's uh, delivery plan, will be subject to full public consultation prior to being finalised. Uh, we will also, as part of the welfare mitigations, um, financially protect individuals with a disability who are impacted adversely by the change uh, from disability living allowance to personal independence payment to afford them time to adjust to the new welfare reforms. Paul Gervin for a supplementary. Thank the Minister for his answer thus far. Uh, just want to know what his, de what his department is doing to uh, ensure that venues and historical monuments within its remit have access to all, including those with disability? Well, there's a range of areas where the Department um, is addressing this issue. Libraries, for example, are a free service uh, to everyone in society. Um, material offered um, includes clear vision and access to books for visually impaired readers, material from Barrington and Stoke designed for those with dyslexia, uh, and e-books and audiobooks. Um, they also provide a home call service for anyone who has significant difficulty in visiting a branch or a mobile library due to ill health, disability or lack of mobility, and who do not have anyone who can collect library materials for them. Um, this again can be provided via a dedicated mobile library, uh, a dual purpose mobile library or indeed a delivery van. Uh, national museums uh, provide free entry for registered disabled people and their cares to both the Ulster Folk and Transport Museum and the Ulster American Folk Park. Uh, this is for all disabled adults and children. All of the National Museum sites comply uh, with the relevant disability uh, legislation in respect, uh, again, of the 190 state care monuments. These are historical monuments. They range from prehistoric tombs to medieval castles and churches, ancient farmsteads, 20th century fortifications, and so on. Many of the sites, by their very nature, are difficult to access because of their location or the terrain around. Uh, as part of the routine works to improve access to the sites, the Department has committed to ensuring that the monuments are as accessible as possible to everyone, and that includes physical access to the sites as well as the provision of information. Uh, access arrangements have already been upgraded uh, at many sites, and uh, all new projects will include consideration of how the sites can be improved for everyone. For example, uh, the walls of Derry, we are hoping to facilitate disabled access on a stretch of those walls. And we have time for a quick question. Here I'm Sir Michaela Boyle. Call Michaela Boyle. Commitment um, in this area. And Minister, can you confirm um, that throughout uh, all of the arm's length bodies within your department uh, that a particular focus will continue to, to be played uh, in terms of delivery um, to people with disabilities and, uh, and as you mentioned through the sports, arts and libraries uh, and throughout all of your department functions and to ensure that people with disabilities are aware of exactly what they're entitled to. Gorm Ogut. Uh, happy to give that commitment to the member. Um, whenever I was at um, Girdwood for the launch of the disability sports um, and the uh, £300,000 that I announced to allow councils to buy capital equipment that people with disabilities could access. Uh, I could see firsthand uh, those young people and children uh, who want to engage in sport, um, something that so many people just take for granted. And those young people were getting so much 
uh, fulfilment out of what they were doing. Uh, I don't believe for one moment people with disabilities should be disadvantaged uh, in getting access to services in Northern Ireland, and that's something that I'd be very keen to pursue. That ends the period for listed questions. We will now move to the 15 minutes of topical questions. Mr Ross Hussey isn't in his place. I call Emma Liddy Little Pengelly. Since 2013, the UK Government has facilitated school aged children in England, Scotland, and Wales to visit the battlefields of World War I, providing an important learning opportunity around the devastation of war, but also the cost of peace, freedom, and democracy, and the bravery of so many. This has sadly not been ruled out in Northern Ireland by the previous Education and Decal Minister. Would the Minister support the implementation of this in Northern Ireland? Well, can I thank the, the member for raising uh, what is a very important point, and she highlights how this has been taken forward uh, in other parts of the United Kingdom. Uh, I do believe that it's vitally important for our school children to have the same insight into the sacrifices paid on the battlefields of World War I as school children in other parts of the United Kingdom. The historical, cultural and educational benefits of such a scheme are undisputed. Uh, it's wrong that this scheme has not been operational in Northern Ireland, and I'm committed to rectifying this. Therefore, uh, I'm glad to inform the member and the House that some weeks ago I tasked my officials to work with colleagues in the Department of Education to implement a similar programme in Northern Ireland, and the Education Minister and I hope to be in a position to make an announcement on a scheme in the near future. Emma little Pengelly for a supplementary. Uh, I welcome the news uh, here today. Uh, I also welcome that the Minister has given some consideration to this matter uh, so far. Could the Minister outline, in terms of his discussions with the Education Minister, the types of numbers that he is thinking about in terms of school-aged children right across the community in Northern Ireland that could avail of this very important opportunity? Well, part of the discussions with the Department of Education and the Minister has been around the quantum of uh, the numbers that could participate in this scheme. I'm keen that it's for as many as possible. Well, what I'm particularly uh, enheartened uh, to hear is schools in my own constituency, um, where the controlled school and the maintained sc secondary schools uh, have engaged in joint uh, visits to go and look at these battlefields, because there is very much a shared history in respect of the sacrifice that was made uh, on the battlefields uh, during the World Wars, uh, and there has been progress made uh, in recognising that shared history, and I believe that this would be a valuable contribution in continuing to make progress on that. So I would be keen that this would be uh, available as far as possible. Gearm, sir, Ian Milne, for whom you cash, I call Ian Milne for Mr. a question. Uh, could I ask the Minister to give us an update on what capital funding um, is currently available for sports clubs? Well, there's a, a range of capital funding that uh, I would like to see released. Uh, the one where there is the, the most priority uh, is in respect of the soccer stadium strategy monies. There's uh, approximately £36 million, which the executive uh, has a, a, a commitment uh, to allow that to be uh, to spent. Uh, obviously, we're in the final stages of uh, what the proposal would be. Uh, when I'm in a position to take that decision, then I would hope that we will be able to open it up to a public application. Uh, it does bring me in to be able to highlight some of the, the thinking for the next four years in terms of a capital budget, because I believe there's uh, great potential to partner uh, with other or third-party organisations uh, around our sporting infrastructure. Uh, I would be particularly keen to see uh, another strand developed uh, for the three main sports, rugby, soccer, GAA, in terms of infrastructure. Uh, that's a proposal that we're looking at that I would want to, to bring forward. I would also like to see if there's other ways that we could partner with third-party organisations, potentially councils, who are identifying the sporting infrastructure in their own communities uh, as to where the need exists. Is there an opportunity to uh, maximising the capital budget that will be available to us? Um, notwithstanding all of that, obviously uh, we have the issue around uh, the development of Casement Park. That again is a, a commitment that the executive has, one that uh, I would like to see implemented. Uh, I met recently with uh, those responsible for taking forward Casement Park. They showed me uh, the revised plans that they now have in terms of the capacity and the way in which it would be configured at Casement. Uh, and obviously, uh, that's a process that the GAA are taking forward. Um, my department is uh, supporting uh, in that process, uh, and we would hope to see progress uh, in respect of that. 
Ian Millen for a supplementary. I got to ask you on Collier August Bukas Foster Don Ira. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer thus far. Um, to follow on to that, uh, what advice would you give to clubs as well, say GA clubs, uh, soccer clubs, and, and rugby clubs, to prepare for any f future uh, funding that may come available? Well, I think that the member raises a good point um, because obviously uh, there are times in year when monies can become available, but uh, the pressure then is how are you going to be able to spend that and, and meet with the kind of tendering processes that need to take place. And so uh, organisations that have a business case already uh, in existence, approved, planning permission is already in existence, uh, that obviously puts them in a better a state of readiness uh, if funding ever does become available through that. Uh, but Obviously, organisations can link in with uh, official governing bodies to get advice from them. I would encourage people to do that. Uh, obviously, councils have a key role to play in developing sporting infrastructure, uh, so they too uh, hopefully can provide assistance to sporting clubs as well as they would want to take forward their plans. Tom Buchanan for a question. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Minister will be aware of the uh, unjust ruling today against Asher's Bakery. Can I ask him for his initial, his initial reaction to this decision and how he feels the Equality Commission handled this case? Well, obviously, uh, there will need to be time to absorb uh, and consider uh, the ramifications of the judgment today. Needless to say that I'm extremely disappointed, um, as will many people be, in respect of the outcome of the Court of Appeal. Um, I, I have had an opportunity just to read over uh, the summary in respect of it, and I know in the summary uh, the Court of Appeal indicates the importance of the faith community in playing an active part in commerce um, and that there should be no chill factor to their participation. Well, I have to say I believe that this judgment um, puts the faith community that are involved in commercial life into the ice bucket, never mind a chill factor. Uh, and so that is something that I think we need to be cognizant of. Um, I, I would appeal to people that they need to consider the faith community in the same way in which the Court of Appeal has considered the LGBT community, where it says in the summary of the judgment uh, that it is obvious of the importance of the LGBT community should feel able to participate in the commercial life of this community freely and transparently. I agree, but I also agree that that should be the same for the faith community. And so the issues do raise a challenge to our society about the type of community that we want. Is it one where we truly have a liberal society, where people have differences, different uh, identity characteristics, and we seek to balance that? Um, or is it one where people of faith very much feel uh, that they are to suppress uh, their conscience um, and go out of business, um, or they are to go against their conscience? And I don't believe that that's uh, what a truly liberal society is about. So I'm disappointed. And I'm disappointed in the way in which, as the Court of Appeal was disappointed, as to how the Equality Commission went about taking this case. Just to remind members that while they're entitled to their individual points of view, this isn't a court of law. I call Tom Buchanan for supplementary. Thank you, and thank the Minister for his response. Can the Minister advise what implications this ruling will have in the future for freedom of expression, conscience, faith, culture and business? Well, I believe, listening to how the MacArthur family have responded to this, that very clearly they feel that uh, those fundamental freedoms uh, have been undermined, and that should cause everybody concern. Uh, and it's something that I think this House needs to uh, reflect upon. I think when you compare the very gracious way that the MacArthur family have handled uh, this process uh, throughout the stages uh, of the initial trial and throughout the Court of Appeal, they have very much demonstrated the characteristics of Christian grace. Uh, when I compare that to the actions of the Equality Commission and the pursuit of this family through the courts, when the Court of Appeal, in their judgment, made it very clear uh, that uh, they did not provide support and advice uh, to the MacArthur family and the Asher's company, um, and then, having today won the case, seek to have costs awarded against the MacArthur family, I think the way in which the MacArthur's have handled this stands in stark contrast to the way in which the Equality Commission has handled this, and I think that reveals the nature of the character that exists within the Equality Commission. 
I call Robbie Butler for a question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, uh, Councillor. Minister. We're practically neighbours here. Let me off with that. Um, for the Minister, how many current councillors are subject to complaints being dealt with by the local government ombudsman? Information I'd be happy to get. Uh, the member who, like me, at one point was a councillor uh, on the great uh, city of Lisburn, but uh, are now here today. So uh, I'm not aware of the, the number of councillors who are currently subject uh, to an investigation by the Ombudsman. I am aware of some individuals who have been subject to an investigation, but the totality of it I'm not aware of. Supplementary for Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your answer. Uh, it was something I was deeply concerned with when we were getting briefings from the Ombudsman. Uh, is the Minister concerned at the potential for vexatious complaints against councillors, and will he revisit the councillor's code of conduct to make sure that it is fit for purpose? It's an issue that has been raised with me by NILGA, uh, the National Association of Councillors, and uh, different council bodies uh, in respect of the, the code of conduct. Uh, and I'm very clear that there is a specific standard that is required for those councillors that are operating a quasi-judicial fun function on councils, uh, namely on the planning uh, committee. However, I should say planning is a matter for the Department for Infrastructure, not me. But uh, that those functions of the planning committee and quasi-judicial functions are somewhat different uh, to other functions that councillors carry out. Uh, and therefore, it's important that the code of conduct reflects that. So it is planned that there will be a, a consultation process carried out uh, to look at the, the code of conduct, where I believe it will help strike the right balance. Because what we want is the, the highest possible standards in public life uh, being carried out by our councillors, many of whom, uh, uh, indeed, I would say all of whom, uh, are carrying it out with the interests of the people that they serve. And a code of conduct shouldn't operate in a way in which it provides a straitjacket for some of those councillors who have highlighted uh, the way in which the Code of Conduct applies. Uh, standards expected of uh, councillors in terms of their private life um, are not the standards that uh, are expected of MLAs, and there is a difference as to how the standard of Code of Conduct is being applied in circumstances where very clearly you're not acting in your capacity as a councillor in the same way uh, whenever you're not acting in your capacity as a member of this House. Um, and there is a contrast between the two, and that's been something that I've been looking at. I call Paul Girvan for a question. Thank you, thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Thank the Minister for his answers thus far. What is being done by the Department to educate the public in relation to the introduction uh, of the new personal independence payment? Well, I thank the member for raising this because this is an issue where we uh, recently launched a new campaign. And my officials uh, are implementing a comprehensive advertising, communication, and stakeholder engagement activity plan uh, to effectively inform all of the citizens of Northern Ireland about the introduction of personal independence payment and ensure that they are aware that PIP is replacing DLA for people that are aged 16 to 64. Uh, a multi-channel advertising campaign began today. It will run until early December, specifically designed to raise awareness prior to the start of managed reassessment of existing DLA claimants. The key aim of the current campaign is to ensure that existing DLA claimants aged 16 and 64 are aware that PIP is replacing DLA and that they'll be contacted in advance of any change of their benefit. Time for a quick question and answer, please. Thank the Minister for his, uh, his, his answer thus far. How is this being communicated out to the wider public uh, and those who maybe have some difficulties uh, in, in accessing the internet and uh, uh, such like? Well, the, the current uh, PIP media campaign delivers the primary message that DLA is being replaced uh, by PIP. And if you're of working age and are affected, then you will be contacted. In order to support the media campaign content, um, it's on NI Direct, the government services website. Um, it was redeveloped to allow claimants to very quickly and easily access information about PIP, including in alternative formats such as audio and British and Irish uh, sign language. Thank you. Okay. Time is up for questions. If members would just take their ease while we change the top table, please.